Ladies and gentlemen, angry Americans around the country and around the world, welcome to an exceptionally important, timely, and I know what will be inspiring conversation with a leader that I think is one of the most important minds in our country. Uh, he's a tested combat leader. He is an expert on leadership. He's an expert on foreign affairs. In my view, he's also an expert on living an impactful life. Uh, he's an incredibly generous and kind guy that I've gotten uh, to know in, in a couple of short instances over the last couple of years, but I'm very grateful to have with us, especially right now in this precarious moment for our country, our national security, and for the American people, the great and powerful Admiral James Stravides joins us today on Angry Americans. Welcome, sir. Paul, thanks a lot. Always great to be with, with uh, an Army infantry officer, so I look <laughs> forward to our conversation. Absolutely. Now, we've, we've met, I think the first time we actually met, sir, may have been on the Intrepid. Uh, you were getting an award uh, from the Intrepid for your leadership, and the Intrepid's a place I grew up going to with my grandfather and then came full circle, and now I'm taking my son there. Um, I just, it, it's, uh, it's a really important place, and, and I remember uh, that moment of meeting you there. Uh, and, and, and I just wanted to thank you for your leadership throughout these last couple of years, but especially the charitable work, the leadership work, the mentorship work you do, and the Intrepid. I, I love the Intrepid. I think it's an, a national treasure, and it was great to meet you and see you there. Um, indeed, uh, both ways. And I, you know, for those who don't know, the Intrepid, of course, is uh, an aircraft carrier moored uh, permanently on the west side of Manhattan. So it's in the middle of New York City, our largest metropolitan area. And every year, hundreds of thousands, millions of visitors come and they get a sense of something you and I understand, Paul, and that's service, service to the nation. And those uh, evenings, uh, which revolve typically around Memorial Day weekend, include this gala. And yeah, I was getting an award, but I was receiving it on behalf of all the men and women under my command at that time. I was Supreme Allied Commander of NATO, I think. And uh, I do remember you, and I remember how tall you are. You're like, you're like tall, I'm, you're like 6'2 or something. <laughs> I, I'm 6'2, I'm but I feel like I'm getting shorter by the day. Um, well, try being 5'5 uh, five, five and you'll, uh, you'll know what being short is if you were this admiral. You know, when I, sir, when I was on that aircraft carrier, I wish I was 5'5", five five, because that's an old aircraft carrier, and I was worried about hitting my head just about everywhere yes. along the way. As you should. Uh, so, sir, I've been asking everybody who's joined us, uh, we're now not month nine of the pandemic. Everyone is dealing with it differently, um, but a lot of these conversations have given folks insight and, and strength. Um, where are you, sir, and how are you? How are you doing? How are the people around you? And what has this experience been like for you and the people close to you? This is such a powerful question to be asking a wide range of people right now. I'm in North Florida, and I'm here because I'm a native Floridian. And when it became clear that we weren't going to be traveling and we were going to do everything we could essentially virtually, I came here to my home. My parents live nearby, my in-laws live nearby. My wife and I have a nice home here in the beaches of Jacksonville, a place called Ponte Vedra Beach. And Paul, I've been here now for nine months without being in an airplane, without leaving. Um, I'm doing, I would say about 85% of what I normally do, which is to say my work in private equity and finance with the Carlisle Group, my uh, speaking, and commentary, which you were nice enough to mention a moment ago. As you know, I'm chief international analyst for NBC News, so I do a lot of commentary from here. I write a monthly column for Time Magazine and a weekly column for Bloomberg. So all of that I can do from my base of operations here. And then uh, thirdly, I continue uh, my work with the Rockefeller Foundation, which is where I try and do my service these days on the board of directors. You know, I can't get on the jet and go to India and help with our rural electrification program, but I can participate virtually. So um, the short answer to the question is, it's going okay, but I will be glad, I think like all of us, when I get a shot in my arm, I am so ready for that. Um, and then lastly, I wanna say, I, I am so lucky and anybody who has a situation like mine where 
your children are grown up and doing well, so you're not trying to homeschool. Um, you have a job that you can continue to do virtually, and you have reasonable finances behind you. I am so lucky, and so many people are in none of those circumstances, mm -hmm. and we ought to be doing everything we can as a nation to help them. I'm so glad you you mentioned that. So, you know, last episode we had Dr. Paul Hazer on, who was an emergency room doctor on the front lines of fighting COVID. And he was a guy that was really in the trenches. He's in the trenches right now. You know, he joined us from his office going back and forth to the ER. And now in this episode for us to talk to you to take a, a step, uh, you know, at the strategic level and look at the entire globe, really, um, I think is going to be really, really important. I noticed in your in your room there, you've got the globe behind you. Uh, I want to ask you a question I've asked of all of our guests. What I don't see behind you is, is a really interesting collection you've got that may be a part of your answer to this question. But uh, Admiral Stravides, we ask every, every guest, what is your cocktail or drink of choice? Well, I am a cocktail queen, as my wife would tell you. And uh, my favorite is a classic martini. So for me, that's Hendrix gin, which is a very floral gin. Um, I like it with two plain, not blue cheese, two plain green olives and the tiniest, tiniest splash of, uh, of white vermouth. I, I use um, a French vermouth, Noilly Pratt. So yeah, I, I am particular about cocktails. We typically have cocktails on a Friday night and it is a way to kind of break up the week and uh, the collection you refer to, I was cheeky enough to send you a photo of my collection of cocktail shakers. So yeah, I've got about a half a dozen vintage cocktail shakers. Um, and I'll break one of those out on a Friday night. It's a great way to end the week and uh, kind of settle down in my case with my beautiful wife, Laura, and have a nice gin martini. You, you sent me a, a couple of the pictures and those are exceptional shakers. I mean, it was the uh, prime folks sometimes say, I'm going to ask you about this. And I ask your favorite cocktail because normally if it was in real life, we would have that cocktail together yeah, in person. We can't do it. We're doing it virtually. But the shakers are beautiful. I mean, these are works of art. Do you have one in particular that's a favorite that you can share with people? I do, and if I'd thought of it, I could have brought it up and shown it to everybody, but you can imagine it. it the, the shaker is from the late 20s, so I think the end of the roaring 20s, and it's about, um, it's about a foot and a half to also about 18 inches. This is a big shaker because they drank a lot in the uh, roaring 20s, and Paul, it's a lighthouse. It is a beautiful silver lighthouse with a balcony around the top, and at the top of it is is the light, and then it, it goes down like a like a lighthouse and has a little base around it, and uh, that's my favorite on a really special occasion to make a cocktail in. Beautiful, beautiful. I think we could do an entire series on your cocktail shaker collections. Maybe we'll have Excellent. to if 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 Morning Joe does a nighttime episode, or maybe we can bring you in for Rachel Maddow's cocktails. I think she said when the end of the pandemic happened, or there was a significant historical event, she said she she'd know that she was breathing easily because she'd bring back the cocktail hour. And maybe we can nominate you to be one of the first guests on the cocktail hour because that would be that would be exceptional added content for MSNBC. Indeed. Totally. So the lighthouse, obviously, a nautical theme around your entire life. Um, you know, you're in Florida now. Um, when you were growing up, uh, when it was in Florida or other places, uh, another question we ask of all our guests, Admiral Stravides, what was your very first car? Oh, great question. Um, I was uh, 16 years old and uh, got my driver's license. And with my, my parents' help, I scraped together enough money from a couple of part-time jobs I had uh, and I bought a Fiat. And, uh, you know, Fiat actually stands for Fix It Again Tony, because it broke down constantly. And I had a Fiat 850 Spider, and that meant the engine was 850 cc's, which is like literally the size of a sewing machine. But it was a little two seat, beat up convertible. Uh, this would have been in about 1970. And I loved that car and dragged it around with me off to the Naval Academy. And it finally bit the dust as I got out of Annapolis. But uh, my first car was a Fiat 850 Spider convertible. 
That's a great car, sir. That's a, that's a, that's a great answer. What color was it, sir? It was a, a really ugly shade of green. Um, you know, kind of, I don't want to say it was lime green, but it wasn't like a really cool British racing green. It was kind of like a bright green and it had a, uh, like a tan top. It, 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 it sounds a lot better than it is when you say, yeah, I had an 850 Spider convertible. Sounds really great. It was pretty much a, a beat up jalopy. It was probably six or seven years old. But it got me around and it was a convertible. And I've always loved convertibles, even though, as you can see, Paul, you and I share a, uh, a haircut, which is to say neither of us have any hair. But in those days, it was kind of fun to put the top down and let the wind blow your hair. Absolutely. That's a, that, that's a great car to have at the Naval Academy. Um, you know, you're, you're a guy who's, who's traveled around this country, around this globe. And I'm, I'm so thankful to talk to you now at this moment in history. And you are one of the finest, you know, strategic thinkers of our time. Uh, you were a guy that, uh, you know, was rumored to be a VP uh, selection for uh, Secretary Clinton. You were my favorite choice. I, I wish that they had gone with you, quite frankly. I think it would have moved things in a very different direction. Um, but you're a leader that, that people look to globally for your strategic analysis. And I want to ask you, really, there's so many things to get into what's happening at the Pentagon with COVID, our global affairs, NATO, but at the, at the highest strategic level possible, and maybe from a historic perspective too, how do you frame up where we are as a nation right now and, and what do you see to come in, in the near future, in the next six months or a year? Where are we and, and what do you see ahead on, on the seas that are ahead of us? Great question. Let, let, let's start with some perspective. Let's start with COVID, which is to say, yeah, we're in a terrible moment with COVID. 250,000 Americans are dead, millions infected. Let's go back 100 years ago. Spanish influenza hits the world. And listen to these numbers. Spanish influenza infected 40%, 40% of the world's population with a 20% mortality rate. So COVID is not going to infect 40% of the world's population. And the mortality rate is somewhere between 1% and 3%. So let's keep it in perspective. Every one of those deaths is a tragedy. But we've been here before, we, the human species. About every 100 to 200 years, a pandemic comes along and we defeat it. And we're gonna defeat this pandemic, we're gonna prove our resiliency, we're gonna get through it. So COVID, let's continue to work as hard as we can to beat it, and we will, and these vaccines are gonna be a plus, and we all have personal responsibility, skin in the game, wearing a mask, but let's keep it in perspective. Now let's step back and say, what is the position of the United States? So here, Paul, I, I'm not a declinist. I think the United States is still a vibrant, important nation that still has many centuries to go in its voyage. However, we are at a point, as we all recognize, where gridlock is really starting to grind us down. And, and by the way, before I talk about that for a moment, let me just make a point. I'm an absolutely a centrist. I'm a registered independent. I've never registered as a Democrat or a Republican, and I never will. Um, you are correct. I was vetted for vice president by Hillary Clinton. I was one of six people actually vetted by the campaign. And I was subsequently offered a cabinet post by Donald Trump. And I think of that, by the way, as two bullets kind of whizzing by my head. <laughs> uh, but my point is, we are in a highly polarized world. And I want to say this to the audience as a centrist, as an independent. And here I'm talking to you. If you get up in the morning with Morning Joe and you wrap it up with Rachel Maddow at night, or you start on Fox and Friends in the morning with the people on the white couch, and you can't imagine a night where you haven't heard from Sean Hannity by the end of the evening, I'm talking to you. We are bigger than those divisions. We, this nation, all of us. And you know, this show is called Angry Americans. I get angry at the gridlock. I get angry at the tone. I get angry at the incivility we show each other. And we have got to improve on that. 
and a logical question would be, well, okay, Admiral, so what do you, what do you recommend? What can we do to try and overcome this kind of gridlock? Uh, point one, just like I mentioned about COVID, let's keep perspective, okay? It, people are fond of saying we've never been more polarized than we are now. Really? Check out 1860 when we went into a civil war and killed a third of the adult population. More recently, check out 1968. I'd say we were more polarized, and I'm old enough to remember that as a young teenager, even than we are today. Um, we've been polarized before as Americans, so keep it in perspective, number one. Number two, I think we can help to overcome that polarization with something you talk about a lot, Paul, and I commend you for it, and that is the idea of service. And here, I'm not talking about simply, thank you for your service, Captain in the Army. Thank you for your service, Admiral, retired, you know, the military. I'm talking about thanking everyone in society who is serving, and there are a lot of ways to serve this country. How about our diplomats? our firefighters, our police officers. You just mentioned doctors and nurses on the front line of COVID. How about teachers struggling to work through this pandemic, teaching a packed classroom in Western Florida in the Panhandle for $34,000 a year. You think they're serving the country? I do. All those people are serving the country. And service is bipartisan. Service is nonpartisan. And so my second point in overcoming this gridlock is let's celebrate service. And then third and finally, and you allude to it before, at, as voters, when we go to the ballot box, we need to look for candidates who are willing to overcome the gridlock. Candidates who articulate that they want to work with people on the other side. And there are plenty of them out there. Uh, before uh, coming down here to Florida, I spent five years in Boston as the dean of the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy at Tufts University. So I lived in Massachusetts, which is arguably our most left-wing state in the country, you know, the People's Republic of Massachusetts. I don't need to tell a graduate of Amherst College about Massachusetts. But who's the governor? A guy named Charlie Baker, he's a Republican in the most democratic state in the country. Who are some other governors of Massachusetts? Mitt Romney, he's a Republican. William Weld, he's a Republican. My point is, there are political actors out there who are willing to reach across the aisle to work with others. And I think as voters, whether you're a Democrat or a Republican or an independent like me, and like I, I would guess you are, Paul, we need to find the vote, the candidates who are willing to reach across the aisles. I'll, I'll conclude here. De Tocqueville, the great French philosopher and writer, came to America in the early 1800s to kind of observe this new phenomena of democracy. And he wrote a book called On Democracy. I'm sure you've read it. It's a largely laudatory book about democracy. But one of the most salient lines in the book is that the tragedy of democracy is that in the end, you elect the government you deserve. I think as voters, we need to take that to heart, act like we are the actual owners of this country and find candidates who are willing to overcome the gridlock that I think is imprisoning us and has contributed to so many deaths under COVID. Sir, I'm glad you brought it back there because it's a central question that we've explored in the show. It's why I created Righteous Media. I felt like we needed a Fox News or an MSNBC for independence, for the unaffiliated. You know, we're, we're looking for options. And this is a country of, of people who now can have 5,000 options on Amazon if they want to buy a refrigerator, but they still have, for the most part, only two parties and oftentimes two candidates. As I am an independent, uh, as 40 plus percentage of the country and a growing percentage, it seems, are independent, are unaffiliated. What is the, you're a strategic thinker, what's, what's, the, what's the path for that, uh, for that community? What is our mechanism without a right now, you know, legitimate third party? 
Um, is there a space to create, you know, that third army, if you will, or that third community, that third movement? If you and maybe five other, you know, really uh, high level independents or unaffiliated folks got a team together, there are a lot of guys like me who'd be going to grab a jersey. So is there a space uh, for third party candidates or third party movement? And, and would you be a part of that in, in the leadership if, if it were to develop? Well, let's start with, again, perspective. People act like, and you are absolutely right in this regard, people act like, you know, somewhere in the Constitution, it says, and there will be two political parties, the Republicans and the Democrats. Let's look at the history of the country. We've had a lot of political parties. We've had Whigs, Federalists, Nationalists, Progressive Party. By the way, that's not AOC. The Progressive Party was Teddy Roosevelt's party about 120 years ago at the beginning of the 20th century. So history tells us, yes, we can have additional or other political parties. And point two, I think we're headed there. Mm. And here, I think it's the millennials. And by the way, I have a almost unbounded respect for the millennial generation. You know, if you really look at the patterns and the demographics of American history, about every fifth generation turns out to be a so-called hero generation. The last one was, of course, the greatest generation, which was a great generation. I don't think they were the greatest. Um, maybe they were the greatest to that time. I'm not even sure of that. But I think the millennials that you and I know very, very well uh, and have served with them and, and you have walked those patrols with them in Iraq and I have commanded them in Iraq and Afghanistan and on ships at sea. These millennials, and I have two daughters who are millennials and two son-in-laws who are millennials. Boy, they are tired of the gridlock and they are angry. And I think there is space and the path to it is hard because these two parties have managed to build industrial level control mechanisms over the political process. But there are a number of efforts in progress um, that I think could overcome it over time, including uh, shifting the way uh, votes are counted, using mechanisms with second choice. Uh, you, you're very familiar, I'm sure, with all this. Um, there are a number of lawsuits um, against the debate commissions, which choke off um, third or fourth candidates with, un, I think, unrealistically high bars. Um, a model, a very interesting model to me would be to look at, and this sounds slightly absurd, but um, the model that is used in uh, You've Got Talent and open up a debate stage, um, not to 10 candidates who are Republicans, but let's get a mechanism that brings 10 distinguished Americans who are reasonable contenders to a stage, and let's have a debate format where every week one of them drops out. Um, you know, again, if you look at how the American public resonates to those shows which are endemic, um, a process like that might be part of this. And um, in any event, Paul, I think this is a rich topic for conversation. I think your numbers are about right, which is to say 40 to 45% of Americans are kind of parked in the middle. And typically they're kind of center, center right on defense, cybersecurity, they want law and order. They're center, center left on most social issues. They want racial justice in the country. They want choice for women. And, you know, we can go back and forth on these things. But I think there's at least 40% of the country parked there, maybe a little bit more. And then you have these two extreme ends of that spectrum. Not bad people, strong believers. And they have their echo chambers at MSNBC on the one hand and Fox News on the other hand, kind of CNN grouped over here and OAN bubbling over, you know. Um, we need to find a path to the center. It's gonna require leadership, some resources, but I think 
it's a it's an idea whose time is coming. Mm. I I couldn't agree more. Um, and as we look at that landscape, sir, whether they're independent you know, left or right, almost universally, maybe with some notable exceptions, there is deep concern about uh, the status and the situation involving our national defense and the Pentagon. Right now, you, I, 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 I've got to get your thoughts on what I think is maybe the most underreported story right now in the midst of all the transition, in the midst of all the, the Trump mayhem. Uh, I've called him President Mayhem bef before because he's kind of a political suicide bomber that blows up everything in his path. And lately, consistently in his path has been the Pentagon. You know, he's, he's purging the Pentagon. Uh, we've now got, you know, folks on, on the uh, Defense Policy Board like Madeleine Albright and Henry Kissinger are out. And people like, you know, Corey Landowski are coming in. Uh, and every, almost every day, it seems like there's a new political assault on, on the Pentagon. Um, it's, a, in my view, a purge of the Pentagon that erodes our national security, that our enemies are celebrating, uh, that most Americans still maybe don't fully appreciate. Can you break down your view? You know the building, you know the Department of Defense, you know politics. Can, can you analyze from your standpoint this, this, I would call it a conflict right now, it seems to be Trump versus the Pentagon. What do you see and, and how uh, important do you think this issue is? Yeah, and, and by the way, a political suicide bomber is a pretty good image. I'll give you another one. It's from the X-Men, the mutants. He's like poison ivy, and anything he touches dies. And, and I feel sorry for people who end up in his orbit because it never turns out well, never. Um, having said that, what he has, you are correct, turned his attention to is his view of disloyalty coming from the Pentagon. And so he fired the Secretary of Defense, Mark Esper. He fired the Under Secretary of Defense for Policy, long title, the Operations Officer for the Pentagon. He fired the, the Under Secretary for Intelligence, who leads the DIA, the NSA, all of those intelligence agencies. And he fired the Chief of Staff to the Secretary of Defense. Those are four of the five most important jobs in the Pentagon. Fired them all and then put loyalists in these jobs. A retired Colonel, Chris Miller, seems like a, a decent guy. He's a retired Special Forces guy. He doesn't remotely have the experience, the background, the proclivities to take on the job as Secretary of Defense. I say that having spent two years as the senior military assistant as a three-star to Don Rumsfeld. I know that job. I know that office extremely well. Um, Chris Miller is not prepared for it. And then he brought in some real political actors at a level below them, including a guy named Brigadier General Retired Tata, who is uh, a very much a right-wing conspiracy theory, hates the world of Islam, um, many, many problematic aspects to him. That group has landed on the Pentagon during a very vulnerable period um, where our opponents are looking at us. They see our uh, back and forth post-election and must be tempted to take advantage. Iran must think, boy, this would be a great time to seize a tank or re-attack the Saudi oil fields. Chinese must be thinking, hmm, is this the moment to go after Taiwan? It's obviously the moment to crack down on Hong Kong. Um, Russia, hmm, maybe this is a good time to go into Ukraine and seize another bite of that nation that we've already bitten a chunk out of. Even down in Venezuela, you see Maduro taking advantage of finally crushing the opposition and he gets away with it because we're not focused and there's no leadership in the Pentagon. So yeah, this is a dangerous time. I am uh, holding my breath, waiting for the new team to come in. And, and, and on a positive note, um, so far the national security team that uh, President-elect Biden has laid out, I think is superb. Um, including not just Lloyd Austin as Secretary of Defense, uh, I think about to be announced, uh, but as well, uh, Tony Blinken at State, Jake Sullivan as the National Security Advisor, Avril Haines as the Director of National Intelligence. These are blue chip, outstanding people 
who have all either been in the job or one level below and are, if you will, tanned, rested, and ready after four years to come back and step it up. So help is on the way. But right now, yeah, we're vulnerable. And the team that's running the Pentagon, it would be charitable to say that their resumes are thin for the job. They're just not up to the task. So, sir, the stakes have never been higher there. We've got this, this, this really fragile, damaged institution. Uh, Biden is now you know, going to announce uh, General Lloyd Austin as his Secretary of Defense. I think a surprise pick to most people. Uh, wasn't on anyone's radar. Uh, he's obviously a retired four-star. He'd be the first African-American leader at the Pentagon in history. But there are two major sticking points that I've seen emerge and that I, I am concerned about, uh, especially in the national security, veterans, defense community. Uh, people are focused on two issues that I'd, I'd love to ask you to, to address. Number one, there's supposed to be a cooling off period for, for generals, right? Seven years. Uh, there was an exception made for General Mattis that, that I think Jack Reed called a once in a lifetime exception. Uh, but very unusual to have an exception granted to a retired general and under that seven year period. So Austin would require that. He also sits on the board at Raytheon. The, the, would be the second secretary of defense in a row after Esper who has very close connections to a defense contractor. That I think is a concern for many people as we may be moving troops out of places like, like Somalia and replacing them with defense contractors. We've seen this massive expansion of the defense contracting role on the battlefields and within the Pentagon. Can you can you 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 address your thoughts on 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 Austin? It sounds like you think he's he's up for the task, but those are two very deep concerns that I have, and I think many others have. Do you share those concerns, or what do you think? I think that they are absolutely the right um, analysis to undertake before a confirmation hearing, and I think those questions will be asked and will be seriously discussed. And I think to the degree there's a, a real warning flag out there for Lloyd Austin, you mentioned it, and it's Senator Jack Reed. I think his exact comment was once in a generation. And um, it's a very valid concern. And you have to go back before General Mattis, as I'm sure you know, you, you have to go back all the way to President Truman um, picking George Marshall and uh, to be the Secretary of Defense. After, by the way, he had served as Secretary of State. I mean, Marshall is sort of, you need to just park him off to the side. He's almost uh, superhuman in his qualities. Um, so really it's kind of the Mattis example you should focus on, I think. Um, I think we collectively, um, speaking now, at, for retired military, I think all of us kind of are more comfortable with a, if you will, a pure civilian or someone who maybe is long retired, you know, kind of 10 years out um, instead of just the seven that's mandatory right now. Um, I think most of us got comfortable with the idea of Jim Mattis because of the theory of guardrails, that we were gonna have guardrails around President Trump. Let's face it, that didn't work out. Um, Mattis eventually uh, quit or got fired, depending on who you talk to, I believe he quit. Um, at the end of the day, I don't think the guardrail argument applies anymore, but here's a kind of a different argument that I would present to you and to others who, who have concerns about Lloyd Austin's relatively recent um, active duty service. I would say the Pentagon is in turmoil. And it's because of this constant churn of uh, four or five defense secretaries in the last four years, depending on how you count them. Um, and that's just too much. It's cycled too much. And so I think you can make a, a good case for somebody like Lloyd Austin, who is well-known, who is well-liked, well-respected, is also himself a very quiet, understated kind of character. He's not a big personality. I think there's merit in that. And then I would turn to the Senate and say, that's your job to look at that and see if, if that argument, the counter argument I just proposed carries the day. In the end, I think it will. And I think Lloyd will be confirmed. Let me get to the second one, which I think is actually of less concern. Um, simply because 
almost anybody who goes into the job of Secretary of Defense is going in because they have some prior significant experience in the defense sector, whether that is a retired former military or board member, or like Pat Shanahan had worked at Boeing. Um, very seldom can I think of the secretaries of defense and think of somebody who just had no connection and came into the job. And I can almost spin it the other way and say, because it's such a hard job and such a big job, I kind of want a secretary of defense who knows the industry, who knows the sacrifices, who knows what it's like um, to be or have been in the military. Bob Gates, who my, my vote for best secretary of defense, certainly that I work for, and I work for a bunch, and there are a bunch of good ones, but Bob Gates was the best, and he had been in the Air Force as a young man. He knew the service. He'd been in the intelligence world. Then he got out. Um, you know, you want someone who knows their way around. And, and so to your excellent point about, yeah, but he was on the board of Raytheon, I think you were accused the hell out of that. You, you really build a stone wall around Lloyd Austin when it comes to anything touching Raytheon. And, and you, can, you can make that work in my view if you're careful mm. and you go at it consciously. So those would be my two counter arguments, but Paul, they're the right conversations to have. I think, you know, the, um, the, 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 we're dealing in the world where we've blown through every precedent. I mean, Esper came from Raytheon, but also refused to recuse himself from yeah, Raytheon business, right? And we had a number of, of senators who put up a bit of a fight. He ultimately went through. Um, and I think, you know, uh, Jason Dempsey, who's joined us on this show, said, you know, the, the folks at Raytheon HR deserve a heck of a lot of credit because they've got a pretty good track record on defense secretaries. And I think, you know, it feels like, Raytheon has become for the Department of Defense what Goldman Sachs was for Treasury at one point, right? It was like yeah. the farm team. And yeah. I think that, that those concerns are significant. I'm actually concerned a bit about whether he can handle the politics. It feels a bit like Shinseki all over again, where he'd been a, a general, you know, done well there, but the deep waters of the political hearings and the media is something you know uniquely well and you've done very well in, but I don't know if he'll have that skill set and he'll be in the deep water immediately and we'll find out. And, and so I think uh, it's going to be an interesting hearing. I'd be curious to see which Democrats are consistent. You know, if they, if they oppose Mattis's nom nomination on those grounds and if they'll do it again. I do think Biden's created more of a headache for himself than he probably needed right now um, in, in getting resistance on what seems to be in some ways maybe his most controversial pick so far. And I wouldn't have expected that at the Pentagon. But I think your, your points are, are really important right now. Uh, we talked about, you know, the political aspect of this. Uh, would you go serve in this administration? Uh, is there a role that you would want to, to, to have? You're, I think, one of the most important leaders of our time. You're a public intellectual, I think, and you're able to translate things. Is there a role you'd want to serve in in this, in this administration? Well, I have a kind of a stock answer to this, which won't surprise you, which is that um, I am willing to serve and I'm willing to have a conversation and um, I would consider service in a Biden administration. Mm -hmm. I would not consider service in a Trump administration. I made that decision, interestingly, exactly four years ago when I was offered a cabinet position and chose not to take it, not out of a sense of righteousness or uh, a moral decision, but simply because I felt like I was just not in alignment with what I perceived four years ago and what has certainly turned out to be true with a Trump administration. Mm. On the other hand, in a Biden administration, I think my alignment would be pretty good. So I would be willing to serve, and the jobs I would be willing to serve in are uh, pretty much filled at this point, uh, but I would never turn down a call to serve for an administration with whom I felt I was aligned and could serve a president well. And by the way, I have a lot of admiration for uh, President-elect Biden. And let me tell you why. This is not political at all. Um, I admire him first because he's resilient. I mean, here's somebody who I, I can't imagine having my wife and baby daughter killed at the beginning of my political career. And at the end of it, my beloved son dies in front of me in my arms of brain cancer. And yet he gets up every morning and thinks about 
what he can do for the country. I, I think that kind of resilience is astounding. And then secondly, and I know this because I've spent, you know, much of seven years around him as a, as a combatant commander, first at U.S. Southern Command, then at U.S. European Command. He is just like he appears. He's a very nice person. He's kind. He's thoughtful. He's got a great sense of humor. Um, you know, I'd be sitting in the situation room and I'd feel someone, you know, kind of massaging my neck and I'm turning around and it'd be the vice president. You know, he's really like that. And those are two pretty nice qualities in a person, resilience and kindness, um, that have nothing to do with his political stance and nothing to do with Republicans and Democrats. So yeah, I would be very willing to work in a Biden administration. I'm glad, I'm glad you bring that up, sir, because that's been my experience with him as well and with Dr. Biden. Yes. Um, and, and you know, all that trauma Jesus. maybe prepared him for the trauma that our nation feels now. We need someone who can take us through a traumatic event. And this is this administration under Trump has been a traumatic period. The COVID uh, pandemic has been traumatic and we need someone who can help us process and lead us through that trauma. And maybe Biden is, is kind of built for that. One, speaking of trauma related to the cabinet, I got to ask you while I've got you on, sir, VA secretary gets no real focus in the media. Uh, it's what many of us in the National Defense of Security uh, veterans community are looking to now. We may see a nominee soon. Uh, there's talk of perhaps a woman, which would be the first female leader of the, of the cabinet uh, position in history. Uh, but, but what do you think is, is the right move there? Do you have a favorite or someone you'd like to see or a type of person you'd like to see there uh, in the Biden administration? I do. I think this uh, screams for a vet, and I think it screams for someone who's been wounded in some way. I, I just think that to bring that level of empathy to that job is, is just crucial. And so as I look at Senator Tammy Duckworth, I think, um, you know, I don't know her. I, I, I've never actually met her. When I've seen her and I hear her, I think she's a nice combination of a kind of a no-nonsense person, but also someone who, who has real empathy and obviously has uh, given a great deal to the country. Someone cut from that cloth would make sense to me. Let me ask you, this is your zone even more than mine. Who do you like? Who do you think would be good in that spot? Um, I think it has to be a transformative figure. I think the agency needs to essentially be rebuilt, rebuilt and rebranded. And it needs to have a, a, a leader who looks and understands and can speak to transformation. I think this is the time for a woman at, 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 at the Department of, of Veterans Affairs. Um, I, you know, I think Tammy could do a fantastic job. I know her. I've worked with her. I don't know if she'd take a, what is essentially kind of a step down in power from where she is in the Senate after going from a rumor as a VP candidate. VA is not a job you go where your career comes out better than when you went in. So there's a lot of risk involved. That's why I don't think, you know, Buttigieg will go there. Um, you know, uh, um, uh, General West or Admiral West has also been, been rumored, Nadia West and, and others. I don't know, but I think it has to be a bold pick. I don't, I got to say bluntly, I'm not about casting or an overemphasis on diversity, but I don't think it should be a white guy. I think we have to reflect the diversity of the force and especially when we're having so many issues with military sexual trauma, with women, with diversity, uh, even with you know, institutionalized racism in the VA and beyond, I think the, the leader has to be transformative. And I hope is a next generation leader who can create a next generation agency. I don't know who it's gonna be. Um, they're gonna have their hands full. I think it's the second hardest job in, in Washington uh, mm -hmm. you know, compared to the president. But I know, sir, you've got to go to some other things. And, and I appreciate it. Um, one is yeah. Dr. Jill Biden. I don't want to overlook, and we haven't talked about it, but education is so important. And she is an educator. And I think that's a nice combination for the nation to put focus in that zone. And secondly, just Nadja West uh, was part of my team at UCOM. Nobody finer should be. That's a really powerful suggestion. Yeah. And, uh, I don't know if they're listening. We'll, we'll see. But, sir, I normally ask folks what makes you angry. You touched on that in a really powerful way. But I want to ask you, you are a source of positivity, of inspiration. Um, you know, anybody who leaves this conversation is going to feel hopeful, I think, about the future, uh, despite the trying times. So, uh, Admiral Servides, what makes you happy? Um, three things make me happiest. 
One, no surprise to anybody, my family. So my wife, my children, my two daughters, they're both married to doctors. So I have, you know, two doctors and one of my daughters is a nurse. So I, I look at them and their courage in dealing with this COVID. Um, just my family makes me very, very happy. Number two is working out. I love to work out. I'm a, you know, any anytime I have a racket in my hand, I'm a, I was on the varsity tennis team and squash team in Annapolis and very seldom a week goes by that I, I'm not on a court of some kind because I think fitness really matters. It, it, it makes you stronger mentally as well as physically. And even if you're you're just going out for a walk every day, you know, physical fitness matters a lot. And third and finally, reading. I, I, I find that the, the act of opening a book and thinking about books and reading helps us, I've mentioned this a couple of times, keep things in perspective. Read about people that really are facing challenges. Read uh, The Splendid and the Vile about Winston Churchill trying to lead Great Britain through the Blitz by Eric Larson, for example. So my family, physical fitness, and reading are the three things that make me happy, Paul. I, I love all of that. that I, that's going to stay with me. And behind you is your book, speaking of reading, that's coming out next year, I believe, uh, 2034. Uh, I know we've only got a, a couple minutes, but uh, your, your current book, Sailing True North, is out. I recommend everybody get that. But can you tell us quickly about the new book you've got coming, sir? Sure. Just in one second, Sailing True North, uh, 10 Admirals in the Voyage of Character is a, a nonfiction book about character. And we've talked a lot about leadership today, and leadership is, is uber important. Character is even more important. Character is what you do when you think no one is looking. It's, it's more fundamental than leadership. We're awash in books on leadership. Mm -hmm. Everyone's written one. This is a book about characters, Sailing True North. My 10th book, Over My Right Shoulder, is a novel, Paul. First novel, and it's, a, it's about a war with China. It's called 2034, like the year 2034. The subtitle is A Novel of the Next World War. This is not Tom Clancy. This is not Peter Singer, Ghost Fleet, techno thriller. This is a cautionary tale. It's, it comes out of Cold War literature when books like The Bedford Incident, The Third World War, On the Beach, Dr. Strangelove um, were books that were cautionary tales. Mm. Um, this is a book of, about why we must avoid a war with China. Mm. And uh, it's, I, I'm very pleased with it. It comes out in March, 2034, a novel of the next world war. I can't wait to read it. Um, it, 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 on that inspiring topic, I do have to, that's a gift, another gift you're giving the country. I want to end by giving you a couple of gifts. You've given us so much wisdom and leadership. We would normally do this in real life and, and have one of those great martinis, but I'm going to send you, sir, first off, uh, Angry Americans gear from our friends at Oscar Mike, made by veterans in America, super comfortable. You can wear it on the tennis court. Um, we've also got some Uncle Nearest whiskey. Oh. Uh, that is, that is a big supporter of this show. Great stuff. 1884, coming your way. We've also got a new edition that you can try out on the tennis court. Uh, Tommy John has the most comfortable pants oh, wow. you've ever seen. And wow. these are um, the, the men's lounge joggers. Perfect. They're amazing. So you're going to get a pair of those. You can have those and wear them beneath your suit jacket when you're on Morning Joe. And then lastly, the kind of Rorschach question of our show that we've asked every guest from the beginning. The Easter candy peeps are legendary. There are three colors, pink, blue, and yellow. Admiral Stravides, which one would you choose and why? Well, I'm a blue guy. Come on, because I'm Navy. Um, and uh, Navy guys always go for blue. But I'm going to break your paradigm and say I want two because I think it's Navy, blue, and gold. You should start telling people those are gold peeps. You, you um, got it. Anyway, you are too kind. Those are wonderful gifts. I want to close by simply saying to you, Paul, thank you for your service. And I don't mean merely your service to the nation in uniform. I mean your service in ideas, in helping us frame up big issues, and above all, your passion and your energy that you bring to the cause of veterans in this country. You're my nominee for Secretary of Veterans Affairs. 
Well, thank you, sir. I appreciate all of that. I've gotten used to not wearing uh, a, t a tie and I'm an independent, so I don't know if they're willing to put me down there. And uh, I, I appreciate that, the kind words. Uh, and I appreciate all your leadership, your mentorship, your example, especially in times like this as, as a father, as, as a business leader, as a military leader, just as a citizen. You are, represent the best of what this country is all about. We need you right now more than ever. Um, and also it's Army Navy weekend. So we've got Army Navy this weekend. I'm going to say go Army. I know you're going to say go Navy, but it's the one time we will battle on the field and then shake hands and work together forever. So I think that's hopefully a reflection of what we can look forward to in the days ahead, especially if you, sir, are, are leading the path. So thank you for all you do. Uh, all the best to you and your family. And I hope you can stay vigilant and stay frosty. You bet, my friend. And thank you for the wonderful gifts. Above all, the whiskey. I'll make a great Manhattan with it. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you, sir.